How do you define the word racism? There are usually two classes of definition. On the one hand are definitions of racism that involve thoughts, beliefs, uh, values, uh, a psychological feeling of distrust, unease, hatred directed toward members of uh, another group that are identified as belonging to a race. On the other hand, there is another set of definitions that has to do with action. It is the uh, behavior of acting differently toward people according to membership in some group that is said to be a race. Thoughts, actions. Uh, sociologists have two words for these. On the one hand, prejudices, and on the other hand, acts of discrimination. Now, one of the things sociologists know is that it's really hard to look inside someone's head. What people think is important. But measuring thoughts is something that is implicit rather than explicit. It is something that is suggested rather than very clearly uh, delineated. It's hard to confirm that a particular thought has occurred. Often, you may ask people to indicate what their values are, and they may respond differently. Uh, but how do you know that that expression is an accurate reflection of how people actually feel? Well, fortunately for sociologists, we're mostly interested in this other category, which is behavior, which is action. We're interested in that, first of all, because we can observe it. It's something we can see. Secondly, uh, if we're interested in sociologists in structures of stratification, that has to do with differences in resources and differences in outcomes uh, when people actually are in competition over scarce resources. We want to know what happens, uh, not just about what people are thinking. What people think matters, but if we take a look at what people do, uh, often uh, we'll find a lot of interesting patterns that don't rely on us making assumptions about thoughts. The problem is that the word racism can refer to both prejudices and discriminations. So you'll find in this class, uh, I try not to use the word racism simply because there's a lot of disagreement about what that word means. And if we get in a discussion about racism and we don't... Uh, make it very clear exactly what we mean by it, we may misunderstand each other. Instead, I'll be discussing racial prejudice on one hand, racial discrimination on the other. In sociology, we have two tendencies when we study racial stratification. The first is to distinguish between racial prejudice and racial discrimination, but the second is to avoid the individual case. It's very tempting when uh, individual people uh, appear in the news because it appears that there is a differential treatment by race. It's very tempting to focus on those particular individual cases and to discuss those particular individual cases. And those particular individual cases for particular individual people are very important. And of course, they're also important symbolically for people who are trying to make an argument about a broader pattern. But for sociologists, the point is to study the larger pattern. That's what we're interested in, and that's where we want to go. Uh, there's also a very basic methodological problem, not from a legal point of view, not from an evidentiary point of view, uh, for uh, whether someone has committed a crime or not, but from an academic point of view in trying to figure out what the larger pattern is when you're looking at an individual person, whether that individual person is Michael Brown in Ferguson, Walter Scott in South Carolina, or Henry Louis Gates uh, of Harvard. In the case of Michael Brown uh, of Ferguson, there is a dispute over exactly what happened. In the case of Walter Scott, uh, there's little argument about what happened because someone shot a video. Uh, Walter Scott is an individual 
in South Carolina who was shot in the back while uh, running from a police officer and was shot in the back by a police officer. But even there, there is room for some dispute. And it's the sort of dispute that sociology cannot settle. The dispute is what led the police officer to shoot Walter Scott in the back. Was it Walter Scott's race? Was it Walter Scott's economic class? Was it Walter Scott's gender? Was it some other factor that we don't know about? And unfortunately, we just don't know. Even when we're not talking about violence, but potentially discriminatory acts uh, for uh, in an individual case, the individual details make it very difficult to tell uh, the difference between a discriminatory act and a non-discriminatory act. Let's take the case of Henry Louis Gates uh, of Harvard, a Harvard professor, famous, known around the world, was arrested outside his own home for disorderly conduct after someone reported that a black man was breaking into a home in a neighborhood. Well, it was his own home. He was locked out, and he and a friend were trying to crowbar his own door open so he could get inside his house. He was arrested for disorderly conduct after the police arrived. Why? Well, the police officer says that Henry Louis Gates, uh, not a young man, acted uh, in an illegal and disorderly manner. It was highly inappropriate that led to his arrest. Uh, Henry Louis Gates said he did no such thing, that the police officer behaved inappropriately toward him, and that the police officer was acting in a discriminatory manner. Unfortunately, we have no recording of the event. We can't tell exactly what happened in that event. Uh, and so, from a sociological point of view, we can't conclusively determine what happened in those cases, and, more importantly, we cannot simply tell from one ca uh, case uh, what variable led to uh, some kind of treatment. We can't tell because there's no difference. Uh, you, in order to have a variable, you have to have observation in more than one case. So sociologists avoid the individual case. We like to study patterns. An old study, but a really good one that talks about the distinction between prejudice and discrimination is one by Richard Lapierre, uh, by Social Forces, uh, published in Social Forces in 1934, in which Richard Lapierre, uh, a California academic, takes a trip across the country. He made 251 visits to hotels, restaurants, and cafes across the country, and he was accompanied by a young Chinese couple. Now, in the 1930s, uh, there was a great degree of anti-Chinese prejudice. On the other hand, uh, out of those 251 visits, uh, he, he and the Chinese couple were refused service just once uh, in, in a hotel, a restaurant, or a cafe. He didn't stop there, however. Six months later, he sent a survey to the proprietors of those establishments, and he asked the question, among many other questions, will you accept members of the Chinese race as guests in your establishment? Okay, notice uh, Chinese has been racialized here, not just Asian. We would refer to an individual as an Asian individual or Asian American. Uh, Chinese was a particular racialized group in the 1930s. Uh, 90% of the proprietors say no to the survey, uh, seeming to indicate prejudice. Is the young Chinese couple discriminated against? Uh, once out of 251 times. Uh, so Richard Lapierre concludes in this study that prejudice does not necessarily lead to discrimination. Now, there's a bit of a methodological problem here. Uh, what is the effect of a young Chinese couple being escorted by a white man? Does that 
lead to a certain level of social acceptability? Possibly. But still, we do see whatever the cause is, that behavior and uh, attitude, discrimination and prejudice are not the same. Let's move on from the tricky question of racial prejudice, which we've covered in a previous video, and think about racial discrimination. To figure out whether racial discrimination still exists in the United States, some say we have moved on to a colorblind society, we look at uh, a useful tool for discrimination, uh, for uncovering discrimination, which is the audit study, in which there are two people these are called testers. One is white, one is black, or perhaps uh, one is a member of a, a third race as well, in which case you can have three people who are testers. These are racial groups that are not based in biology, but that are based in social understanding. And you take these people, these testers, and you give them fictional backgrounds. You train them as actors in behavior, you give them costumes that are the same. You make them identical except for the condition of their race. And you then send them out into the world, and you send them into identical situations, and you see how they're treated. And if they're treated differently, then the only difference in their condition, uh, their race, will be the reason why that different treatment arise, arises, especially if you consider that the treatment occurs again and again and again and again and again, the treatment in this field experiment, this audit study, being um, the difference in race. So repeated observation, only one kind of difference, see how people are treated. Pager, Western, and Bonakowski in the American Sociological Review of 2009 describe a field experiment in New York City. And they have uh, three individuals who are put together and who are matched on their otherwise their demographic characteristics, who are, are tested for interpersonal skill and are ranked and are, give, are, are matched according to that ranking. And they are given equivalent resumes, which means that they have the same qualifications on paper. And then they're sent to apply for hundreds of entry-level jobs. So what do they find? They find a positive response uh, or no re positive response to a job application. For individuals who are similarly uh, qualified, who behave in a similar manner, but differ by racial category, white, Latino, black. 31% of white applicants receive a positive response, 25% of Latinos, 15% of black applicants. That's discrimination. This study is a replication of work that was done by Pager, uh, published in 2003, regarding job applicants in another city, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and individuals made applications to entry-level positions that were listed in uh, a newspaper and JobNet, an electronic uh, uh, job uh, forum for Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time. And these applications were set to be equal in quality uh, equal in references, equal in all aspects except for two characteristics, the race of the individual who is applying and their criminal record. And this is what Pager found. So the black bars represent an individual with a criminal record. Striped bars represent an individual who indicates they have no criminal record. You have pairs of individuals uh, one of whom is black, the other of whom is white. So let's look at non-criminal records first. Among the non-criminal records, uh, white applicants receive a callback rate of 34%, uh, 
black applicants receive a callback rate of 14%, and they're equally qualified in all other respects. That's racial discrimination. If you look uh, at those with a criminal record, uh, the margin goes from uh, between two and three times higher for white individuals to more than three times higher. For those with a criminal record in, in, in their application, 17% of white applicants get a, a callback. 5% of black applicants get a callback. And then if you take a look and you compare, actually, white applicants who have a criminal record to black applicants who have no criminal record, the white applicants with a criminal record do better in getting calls back than black applicants with no criminal record at all. If you're trying to apply for a job, it is better to be white with a criminal record than it is to be black without a criminal record. And if you are black with a criminal record, your chances are dismal. So let's update the LaPierre strategy, uh, says Pager, accompanied now by Lincoln Quillian. Uh, we've heard about what employers actually do. What do they say? And so in 2005, Pager and Quillian follow up that Milwaukee audit study with a survey, and they send it to the same employers who engaged in a particular treatment of applicants. And they asked those uh, applicants, <clears throat> would you hire uh, a white individual with a criminal record? And the bar you see here on, on the white survey of 63 employers is the percent, 61.9 percent, who say they are very likely or somewhat likely to hire uh, a white person with a criminal record. The second bar indicates the percent, 61.7 percent, who say they would be very likely or somewhat likely to hire a job applicant uh, with a criminal record who's black. So there appears to be in talk very little difference between what employers say about hiring white applicants and black applicants. The difference in what they actually do, the difference from the audit study from 2003, is striking. Three times difference, more than three times difference, between 17% uh, positive response and 5% positive response, which is a callback to say, come on in, let's, let's arrange an interview. So we see discrimination here, even when... Uh, prejudice is absent. It is the reverse of the LaPierre effect. Uh, continuing on, uh, Mary Ann Bertrand and Sandhil Mulainathan in 2004 uh, decide they don't want to send in uh, people at all. They want to try to absolutely control for behavior by making sure there is no behavior at all. What they do, first of all, is they uh, send out a massive survey with a huge number of names on them and ask people in the United States to rate those names according to how white or how black they sound. So a white sounding name like Emily or Greg uh, is rated very high on the white end of the scale by a lot of people. So the authors pick that name or perhaps Emily. Lakeisha, on the other hand, is agreed upon by a large number of people. That is a very African-American sounding name. And so the authors pick that name. Why do they pick those highly racialized sounding names? Because then they put them on resumes. And if you have a resume, if you, have, you get a load of resumes in. Two of them are equally qualified. One person has a very white sounding name. Another person has a very African-American sounding name, you have now uh, a situation, a field experiment, an audit study in which there's just one difference. What's the one difference? Racial name. So 
if we look at the top row uh, in the table taken from this study, the callback rate for white names from all the resumes is 9.65%. The callback rate for African American names, 6.45%. Uh, the ratio is 1.5. What does that mean? White uh, resumes receive a callback half again as often as African American uh, resumes do. For every two African American resumes, in other words, that get a callback, there will be three white, white ones that do. Well, is it possible that this is just local to a place? Well, the authors actually send this out, um, send out these resumes to two cities, Chicago and Boston. In both cities, the ratio is just about 1.5, as you can see. Three white callbacks for every two African American ones. Where the 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 resumes that are sent out indicate equal qualification. Otherwise, oh, is there a difference between males and females? No, not really. Uh, females um, versus males, right? They each have a ratio. If you look at these rows of about 1.5. What about uh, females in particular kinds of jobs? Maybe in administrative jobs it would be better. Uh, no, actually in administrative jobs it's worse. Uh, so in administrative jobs, uh, white applicants get a callback 60% uh, more often than uh, African American uh, applicants according to their name. And what about females in sales jobs? Well, that is a little better, but there's still some kind of difference. Okay, That difference begins to diminish in statistical significance, but it is still substantively favoring white names as opposed to African American names. This is, in other words, it's occurring across multiple job types, it's occurring in multiple cities, it's occurring for both men and for women, it's a significant difference. This is discrimination. The only thing that varies is the whiteness of the name or the blackness of the name. Findings of racial discrimination extend out beyond the job market and tell us a little bit more about what happens when individuals of different races uh, encounter the criminal justice system, another one of the institutions that uh, functionalists say helps uh, our society work, conflict theorists point out is a point at which we can distinguish between each other, a point at which we can be ranked, a point at which discrimination can occur. To find evidence of discrimination, uh, a field experiment and audit study was conducted in which customers were sent into a store uh, and they brought up a pair of sunglasses uh, to a salesperson and they said, could you remove that security tag, please? These are high-end sunglasses so that I could try them on in front of a mirror. And then they looked for subsequent behavior. And individuals were told to behave in the same manner. Some of them were of one race, some of them were of another race. And here's the finding. They're, they're looking at subtle behaviors. Uh, there's a phenomenon called shopping while black in which individuals who are black feel as if they are followed a lot. They're asked the question, can I help you? They're stared at a lot. They feel as if they are criminalized while shopping, as if something is wrong with them, as if they're going to steal something. Well, are those perceptions correct? Yes, according to this field study. Let's take a look at the uh, uh, amount of staring. So you have uh, uh, dotted bars and you have solid black bars. The solid black bar is the percent of staring. You know, the, 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 the dotted bar and the black bar add to a 100%. So for white customers who engaged in this behavior, who said, oh, could you take off the tag? 20% were stared at. Uh, and 60% of black customers were stared at. What about being followed as they went around the store then? 
10% approximately of the, the white customers in this audit study were followed. Uh, about 40% of black customers were followed. A huge difference, disparity in treatment according to race when they're doing exactly the same things. This is the phenomenon called shopping while black. So what does it mean? What is it an indication of? It's an indication that if you are black in the United States, which is where the study occurred, that you are treated as suspicious, as a suspect, more often simply by dint of having uh, black skin, which we all know is brown, just as white skin is also brown. But it's a different kind of brown. It's a brown that's been racialized. So an additional step in toward incarceration in the justice system uh, comes from being surrounded by uh, police. At the city level, the question is, are there some cities that have more police, some cities that have uh, a, a smaller police force? And uh, Stoltz and Baumer in 2007 take a look at uh, Census Bureau data, uh, the General Social Survey, and they combine that with the Census of Law Enforcement Agencies, which is providing counts. And to do that, uh, to combine those data sources uh, gives them the advantage of then being able to not just point out which cities have larger police forces, but using Census Bureau data and general social survey data to be able to assess why. They find that if you take cities that have the same crime rate, the same level of income inequality, and the same level of general government revenues within the city, which means the same uh, ability to spend, uh, for cities that are the same, if nevertheless you add a 10% uh, share for black population of the city, the size of a city's police force increases by 72.4 officers for every 100,000 people who are in the city. In other words, uh, cities where there are more black people, even where the crime rate is the same, even where income inequality is the same, even where ability to pay is the same. C cities that have a uh, larger black population have more police officers in them. So individuals who are living in those cities where there are more black people are more likely to be watched. It's like shopping while black, except it's in a city. It's living while black. It leads to greater surveillance by the law enforcement system. Well, what happens when people are being watched? What's the next step? They're being stopped. Uh, when someone is stopped by a police officer, there are repeated studies that demonstrate that African Americans, that black Americans, are stopped at a higher rate by police than white Americans for similar behavior. And in a meta-analysis of 27 research studies in which the dependent variable is the decision to arrest, um, if we hold constant the seriousness of the alleged offense, the presence of witnesses to watch, whether there are drugs at the scene, whether the suspect is intoxicated, and the suspect's prior record, if they are all held constant, all held to be the same across all of these studies, the average probability that a person stopped by the police uh, is arrested is 6% higher when the person is black than when the person is white. The probability of a stopped person being arrested is 6% higher when you have a black person who's been stopped than when you have a white person who's been stopped, when all these other factors are the same. So that's another point of difference. And we return then to Pager's demonstration of the job market. Uh, and discrimination in the job market, where you have individuals who have a criminal record. Well, it's easier to be a white person with a criminal record than to be a black person without a criminal record. But the worst experience of all in the job market occurs for black people who have a criminal record that they report, even compared to uh, an equally qualified uh, white applicant. 
if you compare, finally, the applicant who is black and indicates criminal record to the in individual who is white, who does not have a criminal record, it's a huge difference. That huge difference, uh, about sevenfold, uh, means that white people are much more likely than black people with criminal records to end up in the job market, which leads to, uh, and not just to end up in the job market, but to end up with a job, which leads to all kinds of positive white life outcomes for white individuals, negative life outcomes for black individuals, um, and so racial stratification continues.